welcome to uh, actually our first ever uh, collaboration with the SCCI. Uh, I think, I hope everyone is staying safe uh, and sane, and no matter whether you're joining us from the home or from the office, uh, these are very, very uncertain times. So really appreciate you taking time out to join us for this live uh, webinar. So to, to start things off, my name is Sean. I'm a senior consultant with Kingfisher International Recruitment. I cover the digital and technology space in Southeast Asia, and I'll be your host as well as your moderator for this morning's session. Now to, to share with you a little bit more about the session, the flow of the session today will be a webinar format, will be a sharing session by our very, uh, uh, you know, uh, managing director of uh, King Future Recruitment Group, Mervyn, who'll be doing the main sharing on, you know, hiring best practices, you know, finding, keeping and motivating your staff, especially in these times of uncertainty. And then there will be a quick uh, sharing by our very, uh, very, uh, you know, kind uh, of him, Mr. Ho Jia Tian to from Vitsi, to really do a bit of sharing on how his company, uh, you know, which is a live video sharing platform, um, is able to uh, build effective hiring strategies. And he'll do a little bit more of that sharing later on during the session itself. Um, and the last part of the webinar we, will be a live as well uh, webinar panel session. We will take a live question from you, the uh, audience member, and if you have anything at all that you have questions about, uh, you know, Kingfisher, about your company, about trends ahead, about, you know, how Vitsi does its uh, uh, hiring strategies, that we want you to, to send us those questions live in the Q&A function, and we'll take them as much as we can today. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Mervyn uh, to kickstart the session. Um, and, but before he says, he, 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 can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So before Mervyn uh, start the session live officially, I just want to say Mervyn is the founder and partner of Kingfisher Recruitment Group, a very dear mentor of mine who has been in this space for the longest time. Um, you know, personally for me, I, I, I joined this space from the public and from the private sector. And I've learned so much from this person and I'm very honored and uh, privileged to, to have him lead this session today. So without further ado, Mervyn, please take it away and enjoy. Uh, thank you, Sean. <laughs> Um, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Zaxon and Emily uh, from uh, SC, uh, SCCI uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to, to, to share um, our, our experience uh, in terms of uh, uh, from the HR uh, perspective in today's market. Um, and uh, also, uh, Jia Jian from Vitsi uh, will be our, uh, our uh, guest speaker together with me. <laughs> Um, and uh, also for the uh, the audience as well, um, I think we have uh, over hundred over uh, today, uh, and I know you are taking time from your busy schedule. So, uh, thanks for that. So, um, I mean, uh, you you heard uh, uh, Sean um, uh, uh, given a little bit of a background of, um, uh, of me. Uh, so, uh, for me, I started the uh, business uh, Kingfisher Southeast Asia business uh, about three years ago, and uh i mean uh, uh this topic today uh you talk about uh, engaging the the uh, right uh, talents uh, to build effective teams uh it, it resonates with me because uh, uh it's something that i've learned across the journey of uh not not only starting up business but uh in, in my previous corporate life as well um i was hit by the uh entrepreneurship bug uh uh, when I was in college, so started an IT company, uh, went into uh, retail. Um, it part of it worked, part of it didn't work. Learned from my failures, and I guess one important aspect was that uh, I realized uh, people uh, was my uh, managing people, learning how to manage people, learning how to engage people uh, was my biggest gap, and. Uh, I told myself, okay, I needed to uh, really learn this uh, um, and, and went into corporate life uh, for 10 years um, uh, with uh, uh, international recruitment firms and uh, consulting firms as well. And uh, so, and then three years ago, I started a business uh, together with my partner from China as well. And, uh, and what, what I hope to do today is to be able to share some of the experiences that I've learned, uh, not only uh, through running a business or, or working in, in corporate life, but um, 
working with business leaders, I mean, in, in, in recruitment, you, uh, we work with a, a, a variety of business leaders across from MNCs to SMEs and startups. And, um, and I've learned a lot from everyone. And uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, give you this nuggets of information to help you in uh, building your team or your business. Okay. So, um, I guess the question here: Why, why this topic? Um, like what I've uh, said, uh, people uh, is important, and people build successful businesses. Um, you can have a great product, a, a great. Uh, 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 service offerings, but if you don't have the right people in place, uh, the business won't run. You have a great idea without the people, it doesn't materialize. So, uh, and when you talk about people, it's not just one individual, it's a team that makes a business. And that's uh, important uh, in, in today's topic. So, what we mean by effective team, uh, yeah, it's that uh, a team. When it's effective, it creates that high performance that you're looking for and, and creating that results and success uh, for your business. And I mean, it could be your business, it could be uh, your business unit, for example, uh, or it could be a supporting team. Uh, so when, when we talk about effective teams, um, uh, what, what I always like to use in, this, in the sense is that, uh, you know, uh, one plus one equals two. So that's your, your average performing team. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you, if you get a low performing team, uh, it's one plus one is still equals to one. Uh, there's, there's no value add in that perspective. So a high performing effective team uh, creates that one plus one equals three or more. And that, that is what uh, we want to do. So being here today, uh, we acknowledge that the right talents are important to build success. Okay. So. I wanted to share a little, I mean, I think um, we, we hear this a lot, you know, alone, we can do so little together, we can do so much. Um, there's a, this is by Helen Keller, and uh, there, there are multiple phrases that, uh, that goes along the lines. Uh, so uh, that, that will be our overall team uh, for today. So uh, building effective teams starts with engaging the right talent. Uh, and this, uh, it, it could be your, um, you're engaging the, you're hiring the right talent, for example, or it could be uh, you're promoting someone into a, uh, a bigger role, or you're you're putting a team together to to for a project team uh, to work on on to, uh, a big tender or big project, or you're reorganizing uh, the business, uh, uh, changing the uh, different roles to different people and all that. So, it's the engagement is the key word here. How do you engage the right talent? So before, before we move uh, into the details, so let me ask you this question. Is the best person always the right fit to your business? So we have a poll here. Let me activate that poll. Okay. So um, let, let's run the poll for uh, a few minutes. Uh, what? What, what it means by the best person, it could be, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the best salesperson in the market or the best manager in, in the industry, you know, or, or, uh, or, or it could be, the, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, highest grade uh, that, that uh, student that uh, you, you graduate that you found uh, that applied to your company or, or something like that. Are they always uh, the, the right fit to your business? So that is that question uh, for today. And, and I guess that's the overall team for today. So um, let's close the poll. Okay, so looks like it's a, a resounding no. <laughs> um, we usually, when I ask this question, uh, um, uh, I, I get a good mix of, of uh, results. And I, I guess where everyone here understands that uh, best person is not always the right fit, and why do we say so? Uh, I guess in a way now is for for us to understand what's the mechanics behind it. Okay. So, a little bit fun fact: um, we make one decision 
every 2.5 seconds. Uh, yeah. And a lot of this is made through uh, uh, intuition or, or, or subconsciously, unconsciously in that sense. And, and that is uh, that how, how we, we make decisions. It could be the smallest decision. It could be the most important decisions. Um, and sometimes we use a lot of intuition uh, in, in making that decision. And we often do this, especially in engaging the right people or the right person in building the team. So is this, is this um, a good thing, if you ask me? Uh, yes, it can help you make decisions faster, but we have to understand that engaging the wrong person, uh, if you engage the wrong person, it can lead you to a lot of problems. One, uh, I think the most common one is employee turnover. Um, getting the wrong person, you know, the, uh, the fit is not right, uh, you've got a problem three, six months later, one year later, or you promote the wrong person, things, things change. And that's where employee turnover comes into play. Another part, of course, it costs money. Uh, getting someone in and uh, if they're not working out, uh, usually costs uh, quite a lot of money. And, and we, we, we have seen studies done, it usually costs, if you engage the wrong person, uh, about three to four months of their salary. So uh, things that uh, uh, a little bit steeper there. Uh, another point is legal trouble. Um, I guess if you, you use, if you engage the wrong person uh, or, or you, you know, especially use certain uh, uh, unconscious, uh, unconsciously uh, hire someone that's uh, with some bias that you put into play, um, it can get you into legal trouble as well. Uh, I think we all know the tough at policies and all that, and we try to create uh, a more uh, inclusive and, and uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, hiring methods. So another part is, of course, preventing di diversity. Um, what they say that is 35%, if you, are, if you have a diverse team, 35, you are 35% more likely to perform. So diversity will help you get to your goals. Um, next is to, of course, it hinders uh, productivity. And last but not least, it stops you from building an effective team. So what is the cause of a bad hire? Um, of course, the key one, 80% of employee turnover is because of bad hires. And 60% of bad hires didn't work well with other employees. And not only would you get into the situation where um, uh, you lose your, your company culture or, or you, you, you create a lot more um, uh, uh, turnovers, not just from that one person, but in, ter in terms of uh, affecting others as well. And of course, the financials. Um, this was done uh, uh, survey with uh, uh, business leaders in the market, and uh, it costs twenty five thousand dollars for a bad hire. And if you're talking about senior hires in terms of uh, senior level positions, uh, and it can cost more than twice that amount. So, so we know uh, the cost of bad hire. What what went wrong? What 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 did we do wrong? Um, that question earlier about is the best fit the right the best person is is it the right fit? Uh, we know it's uh, it's it, sometimes it's yes sometimes it's most often it's no. And what happened is that the biasness uh, the unconscious biasness that we put into the the process or is it the selection process uh, to begin with? So let's dive deep a little bit in terms of the biasness. Um, and that is something that I think we, we do a lot uh, and affects how we engage the right people. So uh, in terms of selection biasness, it can cost talent and money. And there are multiple types of uh, selection biases. So some of this, uh, the most common one, uh, we'll list down over here. Uh, the first and foremost is confirmation bias. This is, you can say, the most common one. And uh, what it means is that uh, we usually make a, a, a very quick decision based on uh, some of the, the truths that we, we thought uh, it would be. Uh, uh, or, or you make a, a decision even before meeting the person, uh, maybe through their CVs or through hearsays or, or, or recommendation. And this is the co most common mistake. And I mean, I'll be frank, I, I do make this this. Uh, uh, biasness as well, uh, uh, 
from time to time. But uh, how, how do we avoid it? Uh, we can talk about it later, okay? The other one would be um, uh, effect heuristics. So effect heuristics are something like we, we call it survival instincts. Um, so things that we have learned in the past and it affects how you make decisions uh, uh, in present and the future. Uh, for example, if you have an um, ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend uh, by the name of Pete and, you know, and it, it, it didn't work well, um, uh, that, that relationship that didn't work well, and then you, you have a, that, that unconscious uh, biasness towards that name. And every time you see that name, you, you, you tend to have a, uh, you give a discount to the person's ability or, or skills. So that, that is that, that uh, effect heuristics. Okay. Um, the other one is the um, uh, hello or horn effect, or, or sometimes what I, I like to call it the angel and devil effect. Um, the angel effect is it's when you know um, when you focus or anchor into one very uh, positive point aspects of of, of a talent. Um, for example, the uh, 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 Harvard MBA graduate, and you know, wow, he went to a prestigious school. This person is good in everything, and we end up. Uh, being blindsided by by that effect, so that that's why they call it the ha halo effect. And uh, the polar opposite of the halo effect is the horn effect or the devil effect, where you know you, you get a one one negative aspect of the candidate, and we just can't get out of that, and and we we, we go, uh, we make that judgment based on that. So another one would be uh, what we call it uh, similarity attraction uh, bias. Uh, or, or in short, chemistry. You know, sometimes uh, when we talk to uh, talk to people, we talk to talents, uh, talk to candidates, uh, and uh, we build that chemistry, and we say, "Wow, this guy is good because you know he has a, a great chemistry, uh, and and I like the person, and I, I, I want to hire him. This this guy's the best fit." So when you do that, uh, we move away. Um, uh, we only uh, figure out one dimension of of the assessment, which is the the, the rapport, but the other parts are all missing. And that, that is a very dangerous uh, uh, decision making uh, that, that you can do. Um, the other one would be uh, illusory correlation. Uh, this, this is quite common. And I think, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, sometimes we, 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 uh, we, we, we want to hire salespeople. Uh, we have, uh, I, I know hiring managers who, who, who tend to say that, oh, uh, if the person can talk very well, they, they, they can do their sales, you know, uh, but it's not, it's not like that. Um, and sometimes uh, talking a lot without the listening skill sets to understand your, 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 your client's needs, uh, uh, if that's missing, uh, that doesn't work. So uh, what, what the, the uh, illus illusory uh, correlation here means that uh, uh, we, we, we believe a relationship exists between two different aspects there has no relationship at all. So that is the, the, the fundamental there. Um, next would be something we call it the affinity bias. Um, you know, um, the, the bro effect, you know, oh, we, we came from the, the, the same school or, or we came from, uh, oh, you know, uh, oh, we, we, we stay in, in Ang Kyo, you know, and, and you know, we're all, all alike. And uh, you, you tend to have that, that um, uh, it has no relevance to the role, no relevance to, to the, the person, and you make your decision based on that, and that, that is uh, the first, first step towards hiring the wrong person already. Okay. Um, next, uh, I, I think this is a, a, a very common one as well. Um, they, they say beautiful, be, some, some, some say beautiful people are more successful. Um, I think that's only in TVs, uh, in movies and all that. Uh, they have to be that. Um, uh, and I think that's that is a dangerous thing. So, how I mean, you can be presentable and all that, but don't let that uh, uh, be the justification of your decision. Okay. Uh, last but not least, uh, conformity bias or confirmation bias, we call it. Um, uh, this is uh, actually uh, quite common, especially in in panel interviews or interviews that or, or assessments that you're you're doing uh, uh, with various departments of various people. Um, the worst part is when, um, you know, as if, if you are, you are the, the boss or you are the head of the business and, and you say, I like this candidate, I like this person. Typically, a lot of uh, people under you will, okay, if he likes him, let's, let's go ahead with it, you know? So 
um, so sometimes when when we went uh, or if let's say I interview uh, teams and all that, um, uh, we we try not to give. Uh, I at least I try not to give my 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 decision or, or my my point of view uh, in a very uh, positive or negative manner. Uh, do not let that affect uh, the other panel interviewers uh, in terms of their decision making process as well. So that this is a, a important point, especially you talk about. Um, uh, to to uh, avoid the peer pressure in terms of decision making, okay. I mean there there are other uh, other forms of uh, you can say uh, biasness, but I think we uh, these are all the main ones that I've seen in the market, okay. So um, how to avoid? Um, I mean we we know that uh, uh, those biasness exists and all that. Um, uh, time and time we do make that mistakes. Um, and I personally do that as well. Uh, it's just that uh, how do you want to, how can we avoid that uh, uh, when, when we make that decision or we, when we engage that kind of talent? So uh, first and foremost, you need to be aware. Ask yourself, uh, were you biased? Were you, uh, did, did, did you make a decision from a certain element of biasness? When, when you, you think that way, you will realize that, okay, I think I did something like that. Let's assess it back again. Take one step back again. So that will be key. Second, um, interview training or, or assessment training. Um, you know, they, they don't teach you in school on, on, uh, or, or teach you anywhere in terms of how to do uh, an assessment or how to, to interview someone. And um, I've seen uh, big MNCs um, that who has um, uh, hiring, hiring managers or, or heads of business who, who does not go, has, has not got, gotten through a, 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 a good assessment uh, or tra uh, interview training techniques and uh, they make a lot of hiring, uh, poor hiring decisions based on uh, a, a very unstructured manner or you can say based on a very biased manner. And that often results in um, uh, getting teams that just don't work. Uh, so this is actually a, a very important element. If, if you can put that into, into play in your business, uh, it will help you a lot. Uh, next would be, uh, of course, uh, based on evidence when you, when you want to um, uh, uh, select and engage uh, your, your, the right talent. Um, what it means is that um, you, you want to, instead of using assumptions of, of what uh, they do on, on, on their paper or what they say, um, look into assessing from a behavior standpoint, from a scenario standpoint. These are, are, are some of the more advanced uh, interview techniques, you can say, uh, to, to assess whether uh, the person has the, the, the right skill sets or the right mindset, the right attitude to, 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 uh, to, do, to get that job done. So uh, that's one part that I think uh, you can say the advanced training that you probably want to put into play. Next, of course, uh, a standardized, uh, consistent, uh, and of course, transparent process uh, is always important um, to, to avoid uh, any form of biasness. Uh, consistent when you talk about um, uh, the matrix that you use to hire, uh, the, the guidelines that you use, the, the, the uh, figures, or you can say the score sheet that you use. Uh, if you put it consistently, uh, you will assess the talents from the start to the end in a very consistent manner. Okay. Um, last but not least, uh, a comprehensive and holistic assessment. What I mean by that is, when we talk about talent assessment, um, we often have a very basic assessment of, of, uh, of people. Um, and we usually go into the skill fit, into the history, into the, the, the accomplishment, uh, the achievement. Um, and uh, usually, that's only one dynamic of, of an assessment. How can we go further from there? Uh, there are a lot of other assessments. Um, you can say personality fit, personal fit. You, what is that person's motivation? So these are maybe, you can say, your, your two common ones that a lot of people use. Um, it could be their, their motivations, what, what they want to do in the next three to five years or maybe 10 years. Uh, you talk about their career development potential, uh, where uh, they, they have a five-year goal, can they get there, how can you help them get there, and so on. So that, that, these two are, are usually the most common ones. Um, and uh, what's the missing ones are typically like a role fit. 
uh, have you done a, a competitor analysis? What are your competitors doing in, in such a role? Uh, uh, every role, every uh, job scope of a company, they grow with time, they evolve with time. Uh, are you still using that, that same role that you created 10 years ago now, or have you evolved that role? So how about benchmarking, salary benchmarking? I think uh, nowadays, um, I, uh, I mean, the minister has also mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't uh, use uh, our past salaries as judgment of what salary that that, uh, uh, that, that the cal candidate or talent is going to get. So have you done a salary benchmark among the other competitors as well? What are everyone paying? Uh, can we pay the same or even more? Or how, how do you want to do it? So when you assess things like that from a very holistic perspective, it gives you a better um, uh, decision-making process in, 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 when, when you're engaging talent. So that's the basic side. How about the more enhanced one? Um, this would be leadership fit. So you talk, especially when you, you want to promote someone into a senior role or you, when you want to hire someone into a senior role, um, what is their leadership style? What is their management experience? Have they managed uh, teams? Uh, have they managed a variety of teams? You know, uh, you talk about some people saying that uh, they are, uh, I've managed 100 people before, but uh, what type of people are they? You know, uh, where, uh, uh, what kind of roles are they uh, in? Uh, do they have, do they have a variety of managing? You know, the the the, the millennials and, and versus the 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 um, uh, senior generation. Are they able to manage that very well? Um, so, uh, a lot of these, I think, uh, uh, a lot of companies or a lot of business leaders don't uh, don't don't usually emphasize on this, and, and this is something that we 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 also assess uh, for our clients and and for ourselves as well. Okay, uh, next will be team fit. Um, so this is the other uh, dynamics of, you can say, creating into a team. Let's say you have a team of four or five. Uh, you know, the theory, the theoretical theory of, of uh, 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 team development cycle, you know, when, when you, you the, the, the storming, the, the norming, performing uh, situation. And where's that cycle? Where, how's the team behaving? Uh, are, what? Are they looking for for uh, 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 people? Uh, are they all alike? Are they all uh, different? Are they uh, a diverse group? Uh, you know, all that comes into play, and that that dynamics uh, is something that we often don't use in in assessing uh, uh, a team or assessing the right person for the team. Okay. Last but not least, um, I think the company fit. Uh, what what uh, this is actually a, a very important element that I think very few companies actually do and use. Uh, sometimes I ask my client, what what is what is your your culture? What is your vision? What's your values? Um, uh, typically, the answers are, are very vague. Uh, and if you have a very clear value system, uh, you have a very clear culture that you are trying to create. That helps you find the right person for that job, for that role. Or, whether you, are you engaging the right person or promoting the right person into that role. So that uh, this is what we, we call a, a more holistic assessment, not just a skill set uh, perspective, not just a, maybe just a personality fit, but the role, the leadership, the, the team, and the company. And this gives you that, that uh, total perspective, okay? Next, uh, I would say, uh, you know, we got all the assessment. That's that's a guideline. That's a tool. What else can we do to build a team, especially a complementary team, a diverse team? And uh, I mean, um, you you talk about some of the tools out there. There are many tools that can help you. Uh, you talk about different personality tests or behavioral tests. Um, there are um, uh, some of these tools that you can you can get uh, online as well. Uh, I mean, our, our company has uh, uh, the uh, uses one one of these tools called the DISC. Some of you may may be familiar with it. So what I like to to call it is uh, where's your dot on that DISC chart. Uh, so DISC is a behavioral assessment tool that uh, uses uh, four different dynamics that ha uh, from do dominance, influence, um, steadiness, and conscientiousness. And that has all the different elements in each. Uh, of course, uh, it doesn't mean that if you are just, um, let's say, for example, you are a D 
uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have the others. It's just to what level, uh, 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 to what lev uh, depth of level that you are in in that, in that, uh, in that dynamic. So, uh, for example, um, I am in between a, a D and a C for ex uh, in that sense, and I have a little bit of I, a little bit of S. So, or you, you can say that, uh, uh, you know, you could be uh, the polar opposite of me, you know, and you have a, uh, uh, you're in between an I and an S. Uh, you got a bit of D, a bit of C, and then you, that, that shapes your, that shapes your personality, your style, your, 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 your management style, your, your, how you work with people. So, uh, or, or you could be, uh, you know, a lot of salespeople are, are very uh, high in I, uh, very high influencing side, uh, but of course they have that, a bit of uh, the other components. So when, when you understand this, uh, what, what, what we want to do from a tool perspective is when you understand this, how can you use this to create a complementary team? Um, so it, it is not about me or you or one individual, it's about us, it's about a team. So where you see now in, in this, this uh, uh, slide, you can see that where are all the dots are. That is a very nice uh, diverse team. You know, they are very complementary. Um, you know, imagine you, you hire uh, or you have a team at, uh, of all high Ds. Uh, you, you, nothing gets done because they are, they are always trying to, to dominate each other or, or try to get, get, get their ideas across and, and want their ideas to be, be heard and all that. And, uh, they will get nowhere. That, that will be, you know, too many uh, Michelin chef spoil the cook, uh, uh, spoil the soup in that sense already. So what we want to do is to have that mixture and find that diversity to create that one plus one equals three or more. Okay. So um, besides the two, uh, what we have is a, a 10 step roadmap for effective hiring. Uh, this is something that we, we work with our clients, we share with our clients, what are the things that you need to do, what are the things that you need to, to look out for. Um, we, we shan't go into a, a lot of details here, uh, but uh, we'll give you a very, very quick overview, uh, considering that uh, uh, due to the time allocation. So phase one, of course, is before you hire. You, know, you want to talk about your vision, your, your tone of voice, your process, uh, where, when you want, which, which role and when you want to hire, uh, who, uh, who or where can you hire them. Uh, phase two is our interviewing process, uh, the pre-screening, the interview, interviewing itself, the offer management, all that uh, uh, is that journey that each candidate goes through. Um, and last but not least, the uh, onboarding process, the post-onboarding process as well. So this is, you can say, your, your literally your end-to-end hiring or recruitment process that you need to put in place. Uh, most doesn't, have, does, doesn't do much in phase one. They emphasize everything on phase two and sometimes they do a bit of phase three and that's where the gap is. So um, I think what, what this, this guide can help you is to give you that structure. So um, we, we have that guidebook uh, that uh, will be provided after the, the webinar. Um, uh, so like what Saxon has mentioned, uh, we will, uh, uh, once you fill up the, the uh, 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 feedback form, uh, we, we will provide that, that guidebook as well as uh, the, the slides. Okay, so uh, that is all for um, uh, what, what we, what we want to share today uh, with regards to uh, uh, engaging the right uh, uh, people and to build effective teams. Uh, a little bit about us as, as a group, as a company. Uh, Kingfisher uh, is, is a global provider of uh, total recruitment solutions. So we have uh, four different businesses. Uh, one is the executive search, the, the recruitment business itself, um, searching for both meet, meet from mid to senior levels. Uh, the other business is uh, what we call faculty, RPO, re the recruitment process outsourcing business uh, that we help clients with. Uh, third is staffing, contracting uh, staffing services for, uh, for our clients uh, under the Gallup business. And last but not least, the uh, career mobility transition, the, uh, you can say a bit more like our consulting arm uh, of uh, assisting companies in executive coaching and training in, in uh, using the DISC model. Uh, that's our talent scout business. So uh, a little bit of uh, why we have these four different business is that uh, we want to be able to provide that holistic total solution to any of our clients, any of our, our partners. So uh, our search business across Asia, 
So we specialize in, in industry and function uh, to provide that in-depth uh, market knowledge. Uh, the, the faculty business um, covering the RPO so that uh, we help you scale your business, uh, especially when you have a certain high volume that you need to, to do, or uh, especially or you need to optimize your whole process. We, we can come in to help you on that. Uh, staffing services, I think now nowadays the contracting staffing uh, uh, area is getting a, a lot more popular, um, and uh, especially for remote working. So. Um, this is something that uh, we, we support our clients with uh, from uh, short and long term assign assignments. Uh, next, last but not least, of course, is the, the career mobility outplacement uh, 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 services, career development, coaching, uh, change management, executive coaching. And I mean, you talk about how, how can you use uh, assessment tools in, in, in your, your process, hiring process, okay? Or even uh, using those tools. Um, in, in creating your teams or understanding your teams. Okay, so that's um, the end of, of uh, uh, my part of the sharing. Um, I'm going to transfer it back to Sean. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for that uh, amazing sharing, uh, Mervyn. Um, so the next part will be a, a sharing session by uh, Jia Tian, who is leading a, a local business, homegrown, um, and he has came a long way. Uh, since uh, you know 2013, I think Vitsi as a company is a started as in Block 71 over at Ayuraja. And and for many of you who do not uh, know Vitsi, it's a leading video entertainment platform for short premium content. I I, I personally think of it as a Southeast Asia uh, you know version of Netflix, um, but with much more quality content in my opinion. And um, very, very interesting fact, they have more than 1 billion overviews, uh, you know, powered by Data Insights. They have a really close community and they empower whether storytellers from Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines to really uh, share something about a community or something that they are, they, are, they are passionate about. And anyone can be a, a storyteller, especially during these times of uncertainty. But um, enough of me saying that, I will now leave it to, you know, uh, a dear friend of mine, Xia Tian to to share with you more about Vitsi and his uh, company. Tatian, please. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Sean. Thanks for a kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for just joining in today. Um, maybe just a little background about myself. I, uh, Vitsi is my first company that I started. I I'm actually uh, I studied engineering, uh, but I, for the love of films, I ended up uh, uh, going into a TV operator, which then I went on to actually build uh, different kinds of TV products. And I think alongside there, that's kind of where I came uh, around the idea of uh, creating a community and a platform uh, where great local stories uh, could be shared. So, uh, and, and I think in today's context, I just, I thought I'd just playing a, a video of like what, uh, what we are as a platform so that you can, I can better contextualize, you know, the teams that we have in, in a company and I'll, I'll kind of share a little bit more uh, from kind of how, how we built our teams. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe you could just, this is just a very quick video that we could just uh, watch.
Yeah, so uh, so that's a little bit of uh, what we have as a platform and the kind of content that we have. And I, I think we started out a lot of it, uh, really bringing content on and actually uh, also creating content. Uh, in uh, as part of what we do uh, with this uh, self commercial solution, what we have is actually Vitsy Studio. So what we do, we actually create market original film series uh, built upon our Vitsy filmmaker community, and we then use data insights. Uh, to create a content for a digital first audience. So we work with like brands like Unilever, AXA, all the way to local companies like BBS, Sentosa, Yules, you know, in creating branded content uh, to assist in their own marketing strategies uh, and campaigns. So as, as a platform uh, and community and also a creation engine, uh, some of the teams present uh, within the company include the, the studio team uh, where our producers and all uh, work to create the content. Uh, we also have marketing teams, the content team, and all the way up to engineering, because uh, we, the fundamental backbone of the company, it's a, it's a tech uh, company. We are, so we started out in 2013, so we are about seven years old right now, uh, with a team close to 40 people, uh, with teams present uh, in, uh, in four markets, uh, Singapore being the, the headquarters, uh, followed by Indonesia, Philippines, and Malaysia. And, and maybe just, I guess, a little... Uh, some of my learnings uh, in, in building effective teams, uh, in this whole process, because uh, I just realized it's just a constant learning and relearning, uh, and a lot of it is based upon my uh, on the job, uh, together with on the job learning as well as mentorship and advice. I think there are three key things uh, which which kind of like resonated with me, uh, which one would be culture, uh, the second one would be vision, and the third one would be empowerment. So maybe just to share a little bit on. Uh, culture-wise, uh, part of uh, building team, uh, what I realized is that culture alignment uh, it, it is so key uh, in, in getting the teams rallied together. And I, part of what we do uh, is we, uh, we actually codify our culture um, all the way from day one. Uh, so maybe just an example would be, uh, so we codify uh, our culture based on four different things. So one would be you know, striving for self-improvement, uh, as a team, what motivates each other, uh, and they will be able to learn from each other. Uh, that's one. Uh, then second one is autonomy with accountability. So we always encourage people to you know, propose new solutions, make decisions, learn, and really take responsibility. Uh, the third one is actually living smarter, not harder. So we value a lot of the importance of creativity. Uh, but at the same point in time, leverage and technology will help us work better and make smarter choices. Uh, and the last but not least one will be experimentation. So we try a lot on you know, testing out fresh ideas that help us grow uh, and that would really set us apart uh, from the others. So th this is just an example of what we do in terms of codifying and uh, this, this, uh, this culture points would then be part of the onboarding process whenever every new employee comes on board because um, it kind of sets a little bit of the expectation of who, who he or she uh, is uh, and, uh, and how he or she is going to interact with the team uh, across the board. And so as part of culture, I think that's uh, one key thing is also just really uh, constant like uh, checkups, constant reviews, uh, um, periodic reviews, even as myself as, um, as a co-founder CEO, uh, but across the board uh, to be able to see whether the, that, that each individual and the teams are actually aligned with the culture along the way because uh, sometimes due to life events, sometimes things change uh, and and there are certain things uh, which, or especially when new people come on board, uh, being able to uh, find a, a cultural alignment in the beginning is really key. Uh, the second one, uh, which is vision, I think vision alignment is also a very, a very big thing uh, for for us as a company. Uh, just you know, focusing on uh, more of the whys of what the, what the team is doing and less of exactly the exact work that the team is doing uh, is very key because I think in uh, in especially in managing uh, our average uh, our average age group in, in the company right now is maybe uh, late late twenties early thirties, uh, and I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the the meaning the meaningfulness of what we do and why we do what we do is also quite key. And part part of how uh, vision alignment uh, is done with the team is one is the constant information flow uh, through the teams. Uh, so we have things like uh, if weekly call-ins uh, across all the countries. Uh, everybody calls in every week uh, uh, over, uh, and 
we we meet, we see each other, we have daily conversations through uh, uh, you know messaging platforms, and also uh, one part of it is also uh, we we utilize other tools like uh, so we use workplace by Facebook. Uh, it's a way to really just share articles, thoughts, what's happening around us, which fundamentally also share uh, you know this is the day to day. I, one is casting the vision and then this is more the day to day how does that vision realize and what we see around us and how do we uh, are we able to kind of uh, share our thoughts and learnings uh, with our colleagues so that's one and i think with um with i mean with covid i think everyone knows that remote working arrangements are even more important uh, uh than ever and i, I think uh, prior prior to covid uh, managing uh managing my teams outside of uh, singapore i spent a lot of time in market uh, just really being able to build, uh, to build FaceTime uh, and rapport because uh, I think uh, a very big part of uh, casting that vision would then allow uh, allow the teams to then uh, be empowered, uh, which leads me to my third point uh, around empowerment. Um, so, uh, so in a company about of, of close to 40, we, we have a few key departments uh, and each of them have different leads. Um, so empowerment, uh, with the the leads are, are key, uh, we uh, so I spend time growing uh, and growing, spending time just with that leads because I can just spend time with everyone, but specifically with them. And I think uh, the the key is uh, in doing more things uh, with less time uh, is true empowerment. Uh, but at the same point in time, that comes with those expectations and accountability, uh, and a lot of uh, the. Uh, the area of empowerment also comes with uh, also listening uh, and coaching, uh, which is, you know, very, listening is a very big part of coaching, uh, which allows the, the leads to be able to catch their vision and then be empowered to run on their own. So this, yeah, so this is kind of like the three, three key things uh, uh, that I've uh, learned so far uh, from culture to vision uh, to empowerment uh, in, in running my, my teams. Right. Thank you for for sharing that, um, uh, Jatian. I think I wanted to just uh, talk about the, is there, and I think this is something I think potentially we can cover in the panel session. And um, the panel session, ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time is where we will bring both, um, you know, Jatian back uh, and Mervin back as well to really elaborate some of the pointers that they made. And I think more importantly, to answer some of the questions that you have sent in uh, during the last hour. So if you haven't uh, sent in those questions, please do send them through right now. We'll take them live on the spot. And if you have any questions regarding uh, you know, the content or what Satya has mentioned, please do not hesitate to ask them too. Um, so I think before, uh, Mervin, are you there? Just to mic check? Yes. Okay, great. So I think one of the, uh, the there's a lot of, uh, you know, conversations and that, that's been talking about, you know, empowerment, culture. I think Satyan has talked about in that, that three things he, he just mentioned. Can I really understand what are the challenges in implementing, you know, a good culture and how do you manage to go about, you know, getting that? Do you need to empower HR? I think... You know, do you need to create a team to do that? How do you guys, in your personal opinion, both of you, both being business founders, uh, do that within your respective companies? So, yeah, so uh, for, for us, I think, I think a lot of it is really not just only for the people team, but it's really across the different leads, uh, being able to cultivate that culture. So I think like what I mentioned earlier, codifying is one because it just really puts it, you know, in black and white, but that doesn't really mean anything when it's not internalized. So I think a lot of it's really uh, in the everyday, uh, everyday conversations in terms of, you know, what, why we, why this culturally matters. Sometimes it's just really when things don't fit right. Uh, some, you know, especially when sometimes when new people come in and then when, uh, when we, when, when certain parts of what they say or certain things that they, uh, they, they do, which doesn't fit right, we immediately correct also uh, to just, you know, just really reinforce, you know, what does it mean uh, to, by what we mentioned earlier on uh, in terms of our culture. So I think a lot of it's really uh, the everyday piece and uh, who to do the everyday piece of, you know, uh, being able to create a culture so, so with the leads, uh, them running the teams, uh, being able to, uh, are involved in the everyday conversations and be able to help shape uh, that cultural source. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mervin, yourself? 
Um, thanks, thanks, uh, Cha uh, In terms of the sharing, uh, I think uh, you you emphasize a lot on that culture element, and I think uh, it's also uh, it is uh, I, I'm quite I, I'm I'm very aligned to that, um, and I think that that's some of the questions that was uh, uh, asked by the attendees as well. Um, you talk about. Uh, uh, where the future is changing so fast, how can I know if the one that I'm hiring is the right talent for my company, future need? Uh, and and you, you talk about uh, how, how do you manage the new recruits to blend them in the new work model on a global scale? Um, very good questions. Um, and I think that um, it, it starts with, with that, uh, how, how you create the structure of your culture. Yeah. Um, what, what's that value system? Okay. Because um, what, what we see is that every business, every team's people and all that will evolve. Uh, they will grow, they will get better. Some, some will get better faster, some will take longer time, you know, and, uh, and what doesn't change if you have the right uh, um, uh, system or, 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 or culture in place, that values of that culture doesn't change. Uh, and that dictates the mindset uh, the the um, style of the company, the the, the culture eventually. So uh, in, in in our business, um, we we focus on on the, um, uh, trust, uh, transparency, and teamwork as our values, and that value system is what we use on a daily basis in terms of all the decisions we make, the people we hire, how we collaborate with each other, and with that it creates the culture that we are looking for. I mean, culture will, will, will reshape itself uh, accordingly, but the values, the mindset uh, in that sense doesn't, doesn't uh, I mean, a value, you talk about a value like, like trust, uh, it will always be the same value uh, throughout time. Uh, the business will grow, the business will uh, maybe uh, expand into new horizons, but that value. So if, if you can identify as a company, what is that value that will permeate in every every person, individual and teams in, your, in the business, I think that is key. And um, uh, then you ask yourself, what, what is that values? What is my company vision values? Um, and when you have that answer uh, and you have that, across the board and you permeate across the board that's important and it, it, it starts from the top as well and it, it, it channels through all the way to every single individual in your company okay I um and you want me saying that i mean all that is uh very good i think um i mean i have some um, uh, business owner friends as well i think talking about the culture it's, it's all nice and said it's all very aspirational and i think that's something we should aim forward I think in times like COVID now, where you have to do job redesign, you have to do salary cuts. I think back then in the past, you know, it's very easy for say, hey, we are a nice family and family means we'll always be there for each other. But now when times are tough, I'm going to cut your pay. I'm going to let you go. But if you are really my family, I won't let you go, right? But times now gets a little bit, and then you talk about trust. And I think a lot of companies, especially smaller ones who do not have the big budgets, Right? as much as they put those values and cultures up front, how do you still maintain that trust and culture with the, with the people who are still within the company after letting some of them go through no fault of your own, or maybe to some others is bad planning to a certain extent? And how do you also ensure that that trust and culture remains with your employees who have left the company through whether they like it or not? I think that's a, a deeper question especially in times like this where, you know, you have to break the bad news and, you know, even though we are family before, but what are we now, right? So how do you then communicate a culture when times are tough to employees who are still around and to employees who have left the building? Yeah. So, so for us, I think uh, first and foremost is definitely the communication is really key uh, in this whole thing. Um, so the... I mean, it's as tough as it is, uh, and as a fact, uh, I think the, the reasons why, and just being really transparent and as possible and as humanly as possible uh, is really key. Uh, I guess that is on the part of making that difficult decision. Uh, but then the other parts of uh, just over communicating along the way of you know what's really happening and how everybody might be feeling and also at the same point at the time listening in, I, I think that 
just like a friend in that sense, I think it's really key because especially when certain things are, uh, have, have to be done just because of the climate that we're in, uh, that, that's one area. And I think the, the other part of it is really rebuilding. Um, so as much as there is a pain and there's certain hurt, it's one is acknowledging it and the second one is really rebuilding. Uh, I think morale, morale would, would be hurt uh, for sure. Uh, but I, I think the key thing is really spending time uh, uh, then it like either both from an individual basis or even with uh, on a more uh, not so formal basis to really rebuild that uh, that trust. Because and then I, I think the key thing is also to know uh, yes there is this challenge that we are facing or uh, maybe uh, people being let go or uh, or whatnot. Uh, but the key thing is what next? What after this? I think to be able to see what's beyond this uh, adversity that we're going through and how do we get there, I, I think it's, it's just as important to even you know, cast that vision where where this is, how long we will take, or and you know what are the key factors to be able to get through this hurdle. So I think uh, that will actually help people band together uh, to really see what really matters to you as a as a as a leader uh, at a, and as a company. Uh, at the same point in time, when you do reach there. You've got to also look back and you know acknowledge the uh, what your team has done for you, and at that point in time, I think that will be the part where trust will be potentially rebuilt or even deeper uh, level because we all have gone through this together. Yeah, I, I like the part where you say acknowledging, you know, how you get there together with the team. Yeah, so that's pretty pretty nice. Uh, Mervin, what what anything else you would like to say to that as well? Um, I. I I think that that uh, communication that what uh, Jia uh, is saying is, is important. It's very, very important. Um, how do you communicate that? Uh, and as business leaders or in, in or HR in, in that in that aspect, that how do you translate that information to to everyone uh, as as a whole and individually as well to meet yep. everyone's uh, questions and needs and all that. So um, yes. Uh, trust uh, will, will deteriorate in, 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 in times like this. Um, morale will deteriorate. Uh, um, like, like any, any, any uh, business growth, uh, they go through uh, good times, hard times. And um, how you go through the hard times uh, will make you even stronger. So when you talk about um, uh, how do you manage uh, uh, people are going out, uh, uh, how do you help them uh, uh, throughout that process? You know, um, uh, some MNCs are, are closing their, their, their business in some of the regions and moving them elsewhere and all that. So um, some of these companies, what they do is that uh, they, they have uh, what we call it outplacement services where they, they will uh, uh, engage uh, in, uh, the party vendors who, who will be able to help them communicate and message uh, and create that messaging uh, to to the uh, to the outgoing employees and help them find new jobs as well. Because as much as you are hiring them, uh, and sometimes the business can't afford them, you know, uh, you you just have to help let them go. Um, uh, how do you go the extra mile to make sure that uh, they can still find a livelihood or train them to find a livelihood as well? So I think that 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 gives that that positive element. Not only uh, the people that's going out, but the internal people. Because mm. you know, uh, the people are still in, in the business, right? They they yep. feel you know what I, the business is, is trying very hard, and even with people who's living, they are helping them, you know. So then then you, you build that a little bit of that confidence. It's not hundred percent, of course, uh, but it get, gives you that sense. Um, so I mean, I think there's a, a a lot of good questions in 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 the the uh, uh, from the attendees and, and um, uh, we, a lot talk about you know where where. Mm -hmm. the, the changing demand of the, how how the work uh, 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 the work environment the, the low morale uh, the uncertainty um, I think in, in it's unfortunate that that's happening today um, but um, I think in the end remember uh, uh, remember when you first started remember uh, those days where you have to work hard uh, you put in the hours and all that um, that is that time again. You know, um, the, the business leaders from the top all the way to the bottom is in it together. We need to show that. So um, you, you can say that during this time, uh, work from home is tough uh, to a lot of people, especially those with kids. You know, 
and everyone en ends up working even longer and harder during this time. And that has to be acknowledged, that has to be uh, shown uh, uh, to everyone as well. So then that, that's where you start to build that team spirit uh, and, and that's where you start to slowly build that motivation. You, I think what, what, what's important is that do, do not let the, 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 the low morale or motivation um, uh, spiral downwards because that, that's very easy. You know, human emotion is just, uh, can be quite reactive. So when you hear too many negative news, everything goes, goes down. Um, so that, that part on communication that, that Chen Chen was saying is, is, is key. How do you, you know, you, the, the strongest mind in a company is that business leader. How can you come in and, and you know, your role is not, not just to, to uh, build a business and grow the business. Your role is how do you uh, motivate them? How, how everyone, uh, how do you, uh, have that passion? How do you have that? Show that passion. How do you show that positivity? You know, um, how, I mean, the the world can be crashing, or you know, your 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 uh, cash flow may be tight. But uh, as a business leader, you must be able to show that co with confidence that we will go through this together. And that is the key messaging when you put that across. That you build confidence mm. and improve the morale. And for people okay. who have left the business do you still keep in touch with them um how what you recommend like if you want the employer if you project, have right? you have the, the, the outplacement services put in place and all that or you you put a process in place to, to help them get through of course you give yourself time uh right. give some, some certain time frame for you to manage that process i mean uh you can't keep in contact with them all throughout like, for yep. uh, for a long time uh there there will be some time uh that that's required and uh, and I think that, that that's where um, just being um, a, uh, creating the empathy, being more human about it helps. Okay. Um, okay. Because, uh, I mean, as much as we want to go, to go the extra mile, we want to do all the, the, ex, uh, um, the, ex, uh, the, 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 the nice things. Uh, every business has its limits as well. So we just have to find that balance. Okay. Thanks for okay. that. I think another issue that I've been seeing a threat in the questions is um, when we talk about, you know, the, the challenges, you know, facing internal employees and people who have left the business, unfortunately. How about businesses now? I think what we see now is this whole bulk of uh, new talent into the market. We, we see now, as, I mean, even as recruiters and even business owners like yourself, Darcy, and you see a lot of recruits, you know, a lot of potential hires in the market. Um, and some people call it the paradox of choice, right? It's like going to a supermarket, suddenly there's so many milk brands and you have no idea which one to buy. On that note, because of the, uh, you know, people talk about SG training shape, and everyone is more than ever, uh, it's good and bad. It's good because you have access to people you've never thought you've accessed before. Bad. Because sometimes, you know, when you have so many choices to make, how do you know which one is the right choice? And I think that that question, it becomes a larger one. I think one of the questions said was, you know, when you have so many CVs flowing in now, especially in this point in time, and they're not bad CVs, some of them are actually good, how do you manage that process? And I think number two, when you're trying to give, you know, your, your fellow locals a chance, right, to get new people on board the company, how do you then mix around with uh, the first generation employees who have been in the company for a long time with these new hires that could potentially be from the same industry or a different industry as part of this you know, you know, program of helping one another out. So just to summarize the question, um, how do you make the right choice in finding a candidate when there's so many candidates out there? And then number two, uh, uh, how do you then uh, ensure that all these candidates, you know, when they come in, you know, how did they mix around with your current people? Whether are they from a different industry? And I think sometimes some people even ask the questions, are the mindset of these people who got retrenched, are they right for my company when they come in as well? So I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the, in terms of uh, having a lot of uh, choice, I think that's in some ways a good thing. Uh, but I, I think in, in terms of just managing, I guess, workload and just being able to find, uh, I, I think if, for me, I guess, uh, uh, at least our team, if the mindset is not just finding the, the exact right one, yep. then, you know, we won't feel so bad if we're kind of like, uh, as we kind of like go through the series and we might actually like miss some 
because then we might be able to find others in that sense. So, so then we don't kind of like beat ourselves, oh, why did we miss this? But I, I think the, uh, from a workflow standpoint, I think one in one area would definitely be uh, potentially having different, uh, uh, like, uh, different layers. So that means either them answering certain questions and uh, whether uh, how serious are they, because we sometimes also, we do get CVs where they, mm -hmm. they put, I'm applying to your, your company, but then they put another company's name. And you know, it's, it's just really, you, you kind of see where the heart is in, in really getting a job. I mean, it's just, just yeah. really, um, I mean, quite, you know, yeah. spray, you know, yeah. and be able to kind of get something in. Uh, so that's one. Um, the other part of it is also as we kind of, uh, uh, I think especially in our uh, earlier days or sometimes when uh, when we're trying to find like key roles, the uh, one part of it is really uh, if the potential candidate is actually sitting as part of your stakeholder. So that means one of the stakeholder businesses uh, and for us to be one of it uh, through our community, then uh, that kind of adds an extra point and it kind of like surfaces above the rest uh, in a way that it's not, a stakeholder, not just because we know them personally, but rather stick, uh, stakeholder like uh, whom we actually had a good working relationship. So for an example, like our head of uh, studios, uh, first we first knew him by having a film on our platform. And with that, we, we, you know, we started to uh, get to know each other. And then uh, when at the right point of time, we wanted to find someone who could actually help uh, spearhead uh, the creation side of the business. Uh, we, we kind of like, uh, caught up on that basis. So I think, uh, so that, that's also one, one com component. Um, the other part of, uh, uh, make, you know, having new candidates coming in and especially uh, potentially even different generations <laughs> coming in, working together. Uh, I think the, I guess that's where culture comes in, uh, setting the expectation. And I think what I've also, personally been realizing as, uh, I mean, because I started a company when I was in my late, mid twenties, uh, but then right now I also feel old already. I mean, just because how fast things are moving, uh, it's because like the new, work, uh, the new workforce, the, gra the graduates coming in, um, just to really different, uh, a potentially different mindset altogether. Uh, but, and, and I think that that goes back to one of our culture points of, you know, really self-improvement. I myself need to unlearn and relearn and to actually understand who these people are. And that also is that requirement, I think, across the, the leadership team within the company, being able to know, you know, what has been, uh, what has worked before, might not work tomorrow, in a way you kind of like manage uh, your team or when this new candidate comes in. But I think, which then points back to diversity. So I think um, as the, if we kind of know that diversity would allow us to kind of, uh, potentially thrive and be more robust as a business, then it allows us to know why we want to like potentially learn new ways of engaging. And, and that kind of allows uh, the, the, the team to uh, accept uh, the new person in. But having said that, on the other way around is that when whoever comes on board, the onboarding is then the key piece because he or she is then, he, know, he or she knows his expectation of the, what he or she needs to contribute and what is that culture and very quickly I, I mean we see like within the first two one two three months you can you can see whether the person fits or not or it's it's you know just constant clashing and and whether it's something uh, worth having a future but i think a lot of it goes back to also test testing um being able to uh, sometimes we, we, I think one of the questions uh, earlier was, uh, I, uh, one was, you know, seeing through whether it's university graduate or not. And, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's also about testing. Uh, sometimes you never know, you might find a gem uh, and sometimes going beyond, uh, beyond just the from a paper qualification standpoint. And I think a lot of it goes back to what uh, um, Mervyn mentioned earlier, uh, I think through the interview process, uh, through maybe a scenario, a chat or just really chatting about how uh, uh, the candidate problem solves uh, that will really identify uh, how he or she's hit space is and potentially uh, somewhat a little bit of culture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Satyan. Uh, Mervyn? Um, th thanks. Thanks. Uh, um, I think great points there, uh, uh, Chen. Uh, the, uh, I think what, what we want to avoid thinking is that uh, uh, the right fit is not 100% uh, the, the, you know, the, the, it solves everything. <laughs> um, the right fit means it reduces the risk of hire. Um, and, and even by a small margin, it helps you manage your business better. Um, so 
I mean, you, you got that, that question on, on, there's a lot of CVs out there, there's a lot of retrenchments going on, uh, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the new generation versus the first generation uh, diversity, which one do you want to hire? Do you hire the experience versus the, the, the younger ones? Uh, I mean, if you, if you think from that perspective, that's where we start to go wrong already. If we think from that perspective, because that only covers the first few basic elements of assessment. Okay, and we need to think deeper. Um, and so we need to think deeper and go back to the, the, the point. Why do we want to hire this role? What are we looking for in this role? Is it just, just to fit a gap or is the, what, what is the goals? What, uh, so that planning phase is very important for us to identify what, what is needed. And, and, and everyone brings in a certain value add. And if you understand your team's dynamics from their gaps, their strengths and all that, then you hire people who are complementary that can fill that gap. Um, so it could be a senior hire with the experience, they can come in to fill that gap, that value add. Sometimes it's not, sometimes a, 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 the, the new generation with their, their uh, gung owners, right? You need someone like that to you know, push, push the boundaries. So how do you balance that? So understand your team first not understand, don't, don't seek to understand others first, understand yourself first, understand your team first. And that's where you will start to hire better. That's where you have, will start to find better people. Um, you talk about retrenchments and all that, um, the SG traineeship. If you notice that a, a lot of these uh, um, uh, candidates, uh, some of them, uh, especially when they're retrenched, their mind, their mindset is now at its weakest point. Their morale is low. Uh, they don't. Know, they, they they are uncertain of the future. They can sound desperate. Okay, and you gotta understand that candidates and the market. They, I mean, no one in school teaches you how to write a CV, how to interview. <laughs> um, I think you do. The, 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 no, I mean not as a module, right? Exactly. Not as a module, you know. Uh, no one is. It's like a sub training one hour here. Very and there. technical. But yeah. No, no, no one actually teaches you that most important life skill, right? And, uh, and how, and you got to take a bit of a pinch of salt that they don't know. So, but where your interview assessments comes into play is how can you dig deeper? I mean, you you got a, a person who's who's been researched the minds. The, the morale is very low. They probably at their lower state, but then it doesn't mean that they're not good. Can, then you need to ask them questions, uh, scenarios or that show that they have um, gone through tough times and emerged from there. So then that's where you see, oh, this person is actually resilient. He has gone through tough times before he came out. This is another tough time that he's going through. With certainty, he will probably come out again. So when you hire someone like that, then you know that that's why. Because you hire someone who has not tasted failure, and this is the first time they tasted failure. Uh, they might be in the in the rut for a long time. So, do you want to take that chance? For example, so for example, you take uh, you know, you get the, the top A scholars coming out of the uh, coming out of school, you know, uh, all A's, everything is fancy, you know, but sometimes you need to dig deeper. Have they tasted failure before? They understand hard work to get there, but because they are so smart, they, they reach that, that level of excellence very quickly. But do they, have they gone through failures before? Uh, and ask them questions like that and, where they, they, and help them get them to explain what they do, how they felt. So then you get a little bit of understanding of their mindset. When you have that, then you know whether this person, can they go through that? that thick and thin or not yeah okay yeah I, I think i think i saw one of the questions you know like if uh, it's, it's an interesting one um my boss wants to hire someone but i don't think he or she's the best fit uh, what should i do i think based on what uh, mervin and i think Seth has mentioned i think having a very objective you know why is the role even there what is the value at i think you need a uh, objective sort of justification or criteria to then present it to your boss but if your boss still says that I have none of it, then I think that talks a little bit deeper into what the culture of the company is. Is a very it might sound it's more of a cult rather than a culture. If it's just based on just one person and only one person itself. But that's a whole different conversation altogether. Now, I think there are a few questions. I may take one or one last 
question here. I want to ask the, 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 our guests on, on the panel. People ask about future trends in hiring, right? You know, in, in interviewing. Um, in, in terms of the talent market and how you as a business want to get talent or keep talent, what do you think is the biggest future trend that companies should be aware of? Uh, maybe we start with uh, Satyan. Mm. <laughs> I know it's uh, important it's, one. Yeah. yeah, it's really quite. <laughs> just, choose, just choose one. Just choose one you think is important that you want your HR teams to get on top of it. You personally want to find out more. I think that's a good basis to uh, get the answer from. Yeah. I, I do, I, for, me, for me personally, right now, the, I, I think a lot of the future trend is just really uh, e immersing in what the new, the next generation know how the workforce is, how, how they live. Because I feel like the more and more um, the way, we, the place where you work is not just where you work, it's who you are, what you embody. And it resounds a lot of what you personally uh, uh, would proclaim. So whether you proclaim in certain values uh, that you personally have, and I think that blend between what the companies, uh, you know, what, what you're doing commercially, and what you're doing as, as a human being in a community, how you're helping. Uh, I think all these things are gonna blend together. And I think making, making sense of how these things work and not so, uh, and not so much uh, dichotomized, I think will be very key. Uh, and, and the more, and then for us personally, I, I think a very big part of it's really uh, being as a company uh, also using our company as a, as a vehicle and canvas for good. Um, that mm -hmm. means that whatever that we do, uh, maybe through the, f the films, the content that has been created, distributed, marketed, it would leave a certain impact in, in the community and the mm -hmm. audience out there. And, and that's our part that we want to play. Uh, and I, I think that would be potentially where things will move. Uh, and, and I think it goes into a larger discussion on, you know, awesome. you know, commercial and values, you know, do that really come uh, commercial values? And, you know, some of this might look CSR. Is it just purely, you know, just for namesake? Yeah. But I, I do personally feel that there is a much uh, larger purpose that you fulfill internally as a person, as a team, and then yeah. as a company. Yeah. I think people often get the wrong mindset that, you know, to go out to the next, to become the company of the next generation means unlimited leaves means you can work anywhere you want. It means this, they, they see it in very tactical, but I think what you mentioned is then goes back to the why. It's the place where you work sort of a representation of who you are as a person and ultimately back to the purpose of the company. Are you doing good back to society as you rightly mentioned? Uh, I think that's a, again, as you rightly mentioned, a deeper discussion. So thanks for taking that impromptu. Very good answer. By the way, I have no idea where you came at the form, but appreciate it. Uh, Mervin, your turn. <laughs> you have plenty of time um, to think about it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think uh, what what uh, Joshua is saying is that the world is turning, uh, it's, it's mixing up. Uh, it's all going to be grey or uh, it's no longer black and white. Uh, yep. It's going to be very colorful. Uh, it's a mesh of things. Uh, highly complex, highly volatile, uh, uncertainty everywhere. Uh, but that is also good in a certain way. Um, how, how Singapore is, uh, how, where we are now in, in, in this part of the world, is the, 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 the economy will be a knowledge economy. Um, it will be a, a digitalization, uh, automation will remove the, uh, the mundane uh, 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 processes out of the way. So um, that is where the world is going to go eventually. It's how do we get there first? If you're getting there first, great. You are ahead of the curve. If you are not, you need to prepare to get there. Um, I mean, some of the technical stuff that you mentioned about, you know, um, work is now home, home is work, you know, that kind of thing. It's yep. all, all, all work from home now. Everything's the same already. Uh, people are looking longer hours in that sense. So um, it's unlimited leave. Uh, 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 I mean, leave will be, will be unlimited already because they are they're technically at home. At home. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it's, everything is going to be just like that. There's no more that how, how we operate as a business in the traditional sense uh, will no longer hold valid in the coming uh, decade. And are we ready for that? Can we be ready for that? Uh, are we putting uh, certain uh, values, cultures 
uh, structures, processes, uh, digitalization, and all that in place to get there. So, um, and if we can get there, if as a business, any businesses that can get there faster, they will be ahead of the curve. And that's where uh, they will reap the most rewards, um, uh, not just from their own, but from value adding to the society and, and so on as well. Right. I think, thank you for sharing uh, that point, uh, uh, Mervin. I think the time now is uh, 11.58. Uh, you know, again, that's a lot of questions you, but, uh... when you're having fun. Uh, <laughs> we apologize. We cannot take every question. I hope that the responses by the, uh, the panel speakers have sort of uh, answered a, a couple of them and you know you can sort of in, infer the answers from one uh, answer to the next. Um, I think just to, to end off, uh, I think we live in very difficult times, very uncertain times. Uh, as cliche as may sound, you've probably heard it many, many times. Uh, I don't think there is the, you know, a right or wrong answer. Um, but I think the more important thing as we can hear from both speakers is to have the discussion uh, as a community on how do we learn from one another, right? I think both uh, Mervyn and Sian has gone through their own individual experiences as well as uh, challenges to be where they are today. Are we both in the most perfect spot? I would say, what is perfection, right? Um, what is the mindset of the next generation? What is onboarding when you can't even meet the person? Right? So I think these are deeper questions that we, there are no one way to do it. It depends on the industry, depends on the culture of your company, which differs. So I think let's continue that discussion, you know, uh, and hopefully we can answer more questions uh, in the next webinar. If we, we depending on the feedback that we get from your, the survey, uh, you know, we want to really go in depth into, you know, the proper hiring process and of course tap maybe a, a deeper conversation of hiring trends. But other than that, uh, with that being said, you know, we're all in this together. So uh, thank you very much, uh, you know, uh, Thank you, everyone. Mervin yep. and Jen for making time this morning. Uh, okay. If you want to check out uh, more on, on you know, uh, about our Kingfisher as a business or Vitsi as a business, we will share those links with you. Uh, without uh, without uh, further ado, uh, thank you everyone for making time this morning.